1992, first meeting, we had, first of all, we had to persuade people that there was a problem. They weren't sure there was any reason women weren't in astronomy. They thought, well, it's just because they don't want to be in astronomy. And so I think we went to the meeting not knowing a lot about the history of women in science. And what I remember is learning, learning uh, the history of women. Um, the interesting thing was that the first meeting was almost 20 years ago, and we've seen a drastic change in the field in those 20 years in that there is a much higher percentage of women coming out with PhDs now in astronomy and physics. I look at planetary analogs and I try and understand the microbial, the, the microorganisms that live in those, in those materials and how they have adapted. I study how stars move in galaxies. And I actually work on black holes supermassive black holes. I'm particularly interested in the environment of um, active galactic nuclei. These are the bright centers of galaxies. If you have the diversity around you, it has no impact on the work that you're doing. This is a professional environment and it doesn't matter if you're black or white, a woman or a male, from one country or another, it doesn't matter. The, the goal is to get a job done, to learn something. When are we done? When are we done? We're done when the demographics of the profession are the same as the demographics of the society I built my first AM radio with my dad, like full on, really soldering and building. I built, you know, so rockets and, and we, we launched those and we had telescopes and he was the first to show me Mars. And I slowly got into the, the space program that way. I knew in high school that I wanted to be an astronomer. You can discover new things and find out what's going on and uh, depending on what you're studying. For me, it's Titan's atmosphere. My name's Carrie Anderson and I'm a space scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and I'm a team member on Cassini Sears. The Sears is called the Composite Infrared Spectrometer and it's one of the 12 instruments on board the Cassini spacecraft, which is orbiting Saturn. And what Sears does is it goes beyond the human visible um, spectrum part that we see with our eyes into the thermal infrared, what I'll call it. So imagine sitting in front of a fire and you you don't, not looking at it, but you're feeling the fire, the heat from the fire. Well, Sears sees that heat and records it, and then we can tell what's going on. There's this molecule, there's this molecule, there's this type of maybe particulate, a cloud, to try to figure out, okay, what could that be? And that's what we're doing to find out uh, the type of types of clouds that we see with Sears. But if you just kind of look at Titan from a big picture point of view, first of all, it's a moon, and it orbits Saturn. It's Saturn's largest moon, and it's the second largest moon in our solar system next to Jupiter's Ganymede. But what's really intriguing about Titan is that it, it's the only moon in our solar system with a thick, substantial, planet-like atmosphere. On Earth, in our troposphere, you know, when you look up and you see clouds, those are all made of uh, liquid water, maybe ice crystals, or the combination of the two. Now, Titan doesn't have that. It, um, it has methane instead, so you'd see all this methane rain, you'd see methane drizzle, methane clouds, all that. There's a lot of early Earth uh, scientists out there who want to learn about, you know, life. Is there life? Uh, well, you can go to Titan as one possibility because it can be representative of what the early Earth was like before, before we were here. It's a completely different um, environment than Earth, but it has a lot of similarities at the same time, and it's a very dynamic world. And studying it, you can do any type of photochemistry, different chemistry, different physics. I was always interested in math and science, and my dad, I think, was a key role. I enjoyed it, and I wanted to keep doing it and learning, and I'm here. Dream come true. <laughs> When you design a big telescope like this, you come up with the key science drivers to build it, and then you make sure you're building a telescope that is able to answer those questions, right? Because you can't, otherwise as a scientist, I would say, I wish to make a telescope that can do everything, right? And the engineers look at me and say, great, it'll cost everything, right? You can't do that. You have to say, I wish you, you know, you have to say to the engineers, I want to make a telescope that can go down to nanojansky sensitivity, 10 microns, less than 10,000 seconds, with an accuracy of whatever. 
and then they have something they can work with in specs. And so the whole process with NASA of building these telescopes is getting the scientists together and figuring out what's absolutely essential to do the science. And then you go to the engineers and you say, how much is that going to cost? And you iterate until you find a design that will give you the performance you need to study what you want to study. So Webb has these four science drivers. It doesn't mean this is the only things you can learn with it, but it means it's the questions that are motivating us building it. Um, and so the big one, the elevator speech one, Right? If the NASA administrator stops you in a hallway and asks, why are we building JWST anyway? You say, JWST is going to find the first galaxies that ever formed after the Big Bang. JWST is going to go take the baby pictures of the universe. Okay, that's, the, that's how the top field is now, of studying planets around other stars, solar systems around other stars, and, and how those are you know, doing physics. They've gone from finding them and counting them to saying, what are their atmospheres like? Um, do they have water? Have we found any that are Earth-sized at a zone where they would have liquid water on them? Um, so, that, so these are the two that are, the, are the, I think, the strongest drivers for JWST, finding the first galaxies and then really honing in on planets. The other things that we really want to understand is when the heavy elements form. Um, as a reminder, the Big Bang, if, if we just stopped after the Big Bang, the periodic table looks like this. It's kind of boring. Right? And then everything else gets made of stars. Right? All you make at the Big Bang is hydrogen, helium, and a little lithium. And that's it. The Big Bang um, just wasn't dense enough to have three body interactions to form it or stuff. So everything else gets made of stars. And by taking spectra of galaxies as a function of time, we can find the fingerprints of these elements and see how those metals, uh, those heavy elements build up in time. This is some of my data of uh, showing you hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen again, in a galaxy seven billion years ago. Right? It's, um, that's one of the things I'm working on is how to, how to map when, when these stars, uh, when these galaxies build up uh, their heavy elements.